We have constructed the Dirac equation, which is to be Dirac equation. So let me write down the result, what we have obtained last time as the new equation, IH bar d psi xt dt h bar c over i sum over i alpha k d by dx k plus mc squared beta psi of xt. This was the equation equa equation we have obtained last time and these Let's put some twiddles underneath to indicate, to emphasize that they are the matrices. We have first worked out the algebra satisfied by these matrices so that we have consistency with the energy momentum dispersion relations. And after working out the algebra and studying the properties of these alpha and beta, we have uh, been able to construct them explicitly. So one specific representation that we found was, I emphasize this terminology, one specific representation which solves, which solved that algebraic set of equations are these four by four matrices. Beta, the two-dimensional identity. So these are the block. Sometimes I'll, I'm going to skip writing the zeros. Whenever you see nothing, it's obvious that it is a two by two z block zero matrices. So again, to emphasize at the beginning that these are four by four matrices. It's clear as it was from the beginning <clears throat> that these alpha and beta are Hermitian <clears throat> and traceless which is obvious from the particle representation. This explicit representation satisfy all those properties. Okay. So in the next step, perhaps I should indicate that consistency with the energy, disper energy momentum dispersion relation was instrumental in obtaining those algebraic relations and thus this particular representation. Consistency with the energy momentum dispersion relations. Which is E squared C squared P squared plus M squared C to the four. This played an important role obviously in obtaining the explicit solution. It is crucial that psi is a four-dimensional column matrix. I'm suppressing the space-time dependence, obviously. Psi 1, psi 2, psi 3, and psi 4. It is to be emphasized that this four-dimensionality is a property of the space-time being four-dimensional. So this is related to the fact that it is one plus three dimension of four, space-time dimension. If you go to a different space-time dimension, that is one plus one or one plus two, one is always referring to the time zero th uh, component, and the one space and two space dimensions, of course, the representations will be different, and the, the dimension of the spin or space will also be, be, be different. This four dimensions is an intrinsic property, <laughs> automatic property of the space being four dimensional. It is sometimes confusing, I know, that both space-time and the spinorial space is four dimensional. That's a mere coincidence. You know, you have to really distinguish these two spaces. One is the space-time composed of the time and space coordinates. The other are the spinor components, which are functions of x and t which live in the four-dimensional space-time, each component. 
<clears throat> in order to really appreciate that this is the correct relativistic quantum mechanical equation, we have to go to the continuity equation Continuity equation, remember, in the Schrodinger case, is an equation which guarantees the conservation of the probability. That is, it relates the rate of change of the probability density to the inflow or outflow of the probability currents. So it, it was, remember, d rho dt plus divergence of j is equal to zero in that case. And let's see whether we recovered exactly the same form of the Schrodinger the continuity equation in this case. Well, it is more or less obvious that we should because if you identify this portion as the Dirac Hamiltonian, we can write in a compact manner the new equation suppressing again the space-time dependence in this fashion. And the only point to emphasize is the Hamiltonian is the Dirac Hamiltonian as compared to the Schrodinger Hamiltonian before. So let me write underneath that. This Dirac Hamiltonian stands for that expression. Now let me compactify this. If I combine the three alphas into a notation Either you call it alpha sub one, two, three, three, because these are not up or down. This is the standard Cartesian alpha x, alpha y, alpha z. And obviously this one is that the with the super index is associated with the ordinary Cartesian the gradient with the super index. If it was sub index, it would be the minus d gradient. So I can compactify this not this expression and write it as i h bar c. I moved up and brought in a minus sign. Alpha dotted into del mc squared beta. Sorry, this is the Hamiltonian I'm writing. So that is essentially it. When you have the Hamiltonian in this form, it's the Dirac equation. When you have the Hamiltonian in the usual kinetic energy p squared over 2m plus the v form, then it is the Schrodinger. So, we, sh we are expecting that it is indeed the same form of the continuity, continuity equation that we should get. And how we do that? The procedure in the Schrodinger case, we are going to follow step by step. Paying attention to the fact that here the psi is not a scalar, it is a column matrix. So the order of the products is important. So what I have to do next is take the conjugate equation of this one, at first, which I write minus i h bar d psi dagger d t h d psi dagger. Now you see I'm being utterly careful about the notation and put the dagger up because this daggered psi is a row, whereas the, the original one is a column. So I like uh, plotting that particular diagram and I invite you to always check. What is the schematic version of it? The left hand side is the d by dt of a column. In the right hand side you have a square matrix 4 by 4 times a column indeed gives you a column. This is consistent, so you have to always check that. Now, whereas in this equation, the, it has the following schematic form. The left hand side is a row. Derivative of a row is a row. And the right, uh, the right hand side will be the row, the dagger, because uh, Hermitian conjugation will convert the order, times a box gives you a row. Row is row. So if you now multiply this first one from the left by side dagger, you get a scalar, right? Because a row times a column is a scalar. If I mistakenly write this from the right, multiply this from the right by a side dagger, then I get a matrix. Although that's the case sometimes in the exams, I see that side daggers are in the right. Meaning that you are writing scalars, however, you are writing matrices. And matrices and scalars are 
obviously quite different things, okay. So we let, please pay attention to that simple subtlety. It's not a big subtlety, but notationally it's important. So what I do is take this equation, multiply this from the left. Now this time it's important by the psi dagger. So psi dagger multiplying the left hand side of this equation. And I take that equation and multiply it from the right by psi so that both produce a scalar. It better produce a scalar, obviously. And then I will subtract side by side. If I subtract side by side in the left hand side, I have d by dt, psi dagger side. No, let me do it in two steps so that you really see it. Okay, psi dagger d psi dt from the first term, minus and minus is plus. The second term is d psi dagger dt psi. That's the left hand side. And in the right hand side, I will have psi dagger h d psi minus h d psi dagger psi. The left hand side indeed produces as expected because it was our starting point motivation the d by dt psi dagger psi. Remember, that was one of the reasons why we have taken the equation. We have started constructing the equation, assuming that the correct equation should be of first degree in time derivative, in expectancy of reaching that kind of density. Obviously, this is not psi mod squared, this is different. It is the sum of psi mod squares. That is, this expression is psi1 mod squared plus psi2 mod squared, etc., all the way to 4, right? Because it has those four components. Right hand side is a little involved in order to compute the right hand side. Let me open up a clean page and do it carefully. So, right hand side is this expression. So, let me compute that. So what is the first term? First term is minus i h bar alpha del psi plus m c squared beta psi. I have multiplied this from the left by psi dagger. Whereas, the, what about the second term? There is a minus, relative minus sign in here. I put the minus sign first and then I go to the h d psi and take the conjugate of that equation. Notice that in, 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 in this Hamiltonian there is a minus sign in here. And so if I act on it, if I... So this is the one. Let me perhaps write it and then uh, you see what I'm talking about instead of explaining it in plain English. So it is this expression, alpha d plus mc squared beta acting on psi dagger. That's a very safe notation I'm using, right? That's what I mean in here, times time psi. First of all, focus on the Let me elaborate before focusing. What do I have in here? Inside, notice that I just do this inside. It is, first of all, uh, there's a minus in here. The, when you take the dagger overall, that becomes a plus i h bar c. It is alpha times del psi dagger. Alpha is Hermitian, so it doesn't, it's not affected. Del psi dagger, it picks the dagger and it changes order. That's the inside expression. Plus 
and c squared psi dagger beta. Beta is Hermitian, therefore I didn't put any dagger on it. So this is this block. So I can focus on the beta terms. Notice that mc squared psi dagger beta psi, mc squared psi dagger beta psi. So those beta terms cancel automatically. And what is left over is the following. There is a minus sign in here. There was minus became plus and there is an overall minus. Therefore, there is an overall minus ih bar c. And what is left over is psi dagger alpha times del psi. And here, del psi dagger alpha and psi. You see, when you are careful in these really simple issues, things come out beautifully clean. Instead of really just doing rather complicated expressions and try mixing up everything and then guessing the correct answer and writing up the correct answer. You see how without, without doing too much, I have been able to see that things came out in the desired form. Particularly, you shouldn't make any sign mistake because if you make a sign mistake, if this doesn't come out to be plus but minus, then you're in trouble. Now notice what I'm doing. Here there is this derivative acting on the psi, and there is this derivative acting on the psi dagger. Otherwise, what you see apart from those <coughs> gradient or derivatives, psi dagger alpha psi, psi dagger alpha psi order you see. So it is <coughs> obvious that it is the <coughs> divergence of this expression. Indeed, verify it using the Leibniz rule this acts on the first, plus this acts on the second, which reproduces that expression. <clears throat> so it's really nice. The final result then is, uh, let, okay, it's not a good place to write it. So let me move to this side. So left hand side was easily obtained to be i h bar d by d t psi dagger psi and the right hand side is obtained again as easily really the divergence of psi dagger alpha psi. So if I equate the left and right hand sides and then divide by the ih bar both sides because it appears in the both sides. So what you get is d by dt psi plus psi dagger psi and move this term to the right, to the left, from right to left that is. Psi dagger c alpha psi is equal to zero. It's a beautiful equation, isn't it? So we identify this to be the probability density and this as the probability current density and we indeed recover the equation d rho dt as before as in the Schrodinger's case is equal to zero. This portion is crucial because it has the same form. Apart from the fact that it's not a scalar function, but it's a column matrix, therefore it is the sum of four scalar, not really, four function in the form mod squared. So let me remind you, this is a reminder, what is the big deal about this continuity equation? It guarantees the conservation of the probability. Let's check that and then let's play a little bit on the physical meaning of this new J. Notice that this new J is quite different as compared to the Schrodinger's J. I will write that down and we'll compare and see the relationship. And eventually <coughs> we have to check under what circumstances these two currents 
agree, you have to go to a special regime, right? From the relativistic regime to a non-relativistic regime, but we'll postpone it to a later stage. First, let's guarantee, let's demonstrate how it guarantees the conservation of the probability. So rho is, <coughs> rho is psi dagger psi, it is the probability density, which is equal to the sum of psi i squared from i equals 1 to 4. Obviously that is positive definite, being the mod square of a complex function each term, they are all positive definites, thus the sum r also positive definite. So we can keep the original interpretation of Copenhagen in the context of Schrodinger theorem and say that this is really the probability density. The probability of finding an object somewhere, a relativistic Dirac object, somewhere in a given volume like this room, in a unit volume at the time t. It is this thing. So what is the total probability then? Total probability should be d cube rho, which is d cube psi star psi should be 1. Because if this interpretation is a valid interpretation, the sum of all options should add up to 1. And this, once normalized at a given time, you should preserve that normalization at all future times. Therefore, this expression should be time independent. So this is to be guaranteed. How do we guarantee that? We go to this equation, this so-called continuity equation, and integrate over all space. Integrate the continuity equation. The first term integrated over all space and then you move the partial derivative in time out which is converted into a straight derivative because rho is a function of x and t but when you move it out of the integral the inside expression as the space part is integrated out is a function of t only thus the partial derivative is converted to a straight derivative because this quantity is now the only this quantity only depends on time space part is integrated out and what about the right hand side d cube x divergence of j right and using the gauss's theorem you convert this again to a surface integral the surface is the boundary of the volume in question, if there are no boundaries, the entire space. So boundary is the boundary at the infinity, which is covering the space. So it is ds times j. The surface grows like r squared, right? The surface of a sphere is r, constant times r squared. And if we can ensure that this j grows or decreases faster than 1 over r squared, the surface times r squared times 1 over r squared plus an epsilon. So when you let r goes to infinity, it becomes 0. How do we guarantee that j grows, or in the negative sense, faster than 1 over r squared? Let me use that proper, that's a proper English. If it grows in meaning 1 over r squared plus an epsilon power, and it is again hidden in here. You see how these things are intermingled. The existence of this integral, that is the square integrable nature of all the psi i's, guarantees the vanishing of the surface term. L2, these are L2 functions, therefore the surface terms vanish. So th these are not independent checks. One implies the other. So this is, if you go to the, again, 
that, let, let me repeat that famous argument which I have introduced at the beginning of this semester. Now if you go to that, if you try to estimate that expression in the spherical polar coordinates, why? Because two angles are compact, it doesn't bring any infinity. The only variable which is non-compact is the one which ranges from zero to infinity so that it can bring in infinities. So there are two functions, radial part and square of it, and there is dr and r squared coming from the measure. So if you, for large distances, parameterize the r, the radial part of the function, in, in, in regardless of the spin structure, all that complication, forget it. Angular, angular part is not important, forget it. So you have the radial part going to the r to the alpha, and square goes r to the 2 alpha. There is another 2 powers of r coming from there, 2 alpha plus 2. So that's the psi. And what's j? j is quadratic, right? j is quadratic, so it is r squared indeed. 2 alpha plus 2 times 2, 4 alpha plus 4. So alpha is what, in order to this exist? Alpha satisfies the property and this vanishes. You see the point? It's as in exactly as in the Schrodinger theory. Schrodinger theory was a little stronger because in the current there was a derivative, psi star del psi, remember? Derivative decreases the power of r once. More doesn't matter. The space grows only with r squared. So the surface integral vanishes indeed. For, bound, for boundaries at the infinity. So, I indeed demonstrated that this total probability is independent of time, conserved. Nice. Once that is understood, and as there is no further need, quote unquote, to elaborate this any further, let me, well actually there's a need to elaborate that further. Why do I say so? Psi is not a scalar. Psi is a column. Psi dagger psi looks like a scalar because a row times a column gives you a scalar-like thing. Is it really a scalar? It cannot be, right? Because look at this equation. There's d by dt of this row plus divergence of the j. <coughs> if rho was a scalar, d by dt of the scalar was sort of zeroth component of a four vector. So this equation wouldn't be an invariant or covariant equation. You see how subtle the things are. So obviously rho is not a scalar, should not be a scalar, but it should be the zeroth component of a four vector Eventually, I will demonstra demonstrate it in a rigorous manner, but I can feel it at this level, at this elementary level. Rho is not a scalar. I hope that's understood, correct? Rather, we'll demonstrate that it should be like the zeroth component of a four vector. Okay, that's sufficient. That's as much as I want to talk about the row itself. Its explicit form is there. Now what about the current? Current is really interesting because it differs from the Schrodinger's J. Although this is more or less the same because it has four terms in that decomposition which each of them are like the Schrodinger psi mod squared but as the, it's not a scalar function, therefore it's not only natural that it's a sum of four terms of the Schrodinger type. However, this is really different. Remember the Schrodinger's current, h bar 2mi, 
psi star del psi minus the complex conjugate. It looks very different. Remember, we have played with that somewhat and demonstrated that it is like the velocity operator sandwich between psi star and psi. Remember, if you put an h power over i in, it becomes a momentum operator. Momentum operator divided by m is the velocity operator, psi star, velocity operator psi plus the Hermitian conjugate. Now, it is the Hermitianized version of that operator. So j was like the velocity operator then. How do I, can we make the same interpretation in here? If j is sort of the sandwich velocity operator as there, then this should be the velocity operator together with the c, of course. Strange, isn't it? Whenever we really meet this, we always find this obscure feeling. What kind of velocity operator is it? That's a constant. It has a coefficient c. Is the Dirac particle always moving with the speed of light? So what is the really profound meaning behind this? There's some profound meaning obviously associated with this. It is indeed the form of this current implies that velocity operator in this game is the C times alpha, which was a constant Hermitian matrix. So Hermeticity is fine because all the observables should be Hermitian but that it is constant, void of any dynamical content? No, of course not. We see that it's going to lead to many interesting properties, eventually. One strange thing, obviously, that I invite you to think about immediately is that if it is really to be identified with the velocity operator, which I'm going to list two more versions of the same demonstration from through other channels I will come to this conclusion that the C alpha is the velocity operator. Then the strange fact is the following. Alpha is a matrix, right? Sigma and sigma of diagonal. And you know the non-trivial behavior of the commutators of Pauli sigmas. Therefore you can work out the non-trivial behavior of the drug alphas. Let's check first, for instance, to verify what I mean. Let's consider the commutator of two alphas. <coughs> we know the anti-commutator. Remember, that was our foundation. That was one of the starting points. Check against the following. Alpha i Alpha j <coughs> was twice <coughs> delta alpha j, delta i j i. This was obtained before through the consistency with the energy momentum dispersion relations, part of our algebra. But what I'm interested in uh, commutator, because commutator algebras are, are relevant for the measurability or simultaneous measurability. If you have two operators which commute among themselves, then you know that you can measure them simultaneously because they will have common set of eigenfunctions. So what is the algebra of this alpha i, alpha j? There's a very easy way of doing it. I invite you to, to follow my, uh, this, uh, <laughs> my method of primary school, I call it. You just take the two, algebra, two matrices and multiply and take the reverse order and subtract. So what I do is the following. Instead of trying to use sophisticated algebra Clifford, this is the first term. The second term is sigma j <coughs> minus the i and j are interchanged. If I can work out the first one and we can immediately write down the second one by interchanging the i, j and subtracting. <coughs> what is this? The first one is sigma i, sigma j. And the other one is zero, this one is zero, and this one is sigma i, sigma j. How nice. <clears throat> the thing then, it appeared in the diagonals. And you take the uh, minus the interchange ones. So I, let me use the same block instead of repeating everything. 
So I get this beautiful expression. Sigma I, sigma J commutators at the diagonal positions, and I know what that algebra is. That is twice I epsilon I J K <coughs> sigma K and sigma K. What is the sigma K, sigma K at the diagonal? We give it a name. Some of you know it already. You have seen, we call it the capital sigma. To, which mimics the Pauli sigma of two dimensions in four dimensions, and they sit at the diagonal, therefore we call it the capital sigma. That's the definition of the capital sigma. So I write this as twice i epsilon i j k sigma k. Sigma is that. When I have, remember I said when I write nothing, you have to understand that there are zeros sitting there. So there's this interesting algebra. The commutator of alpha i alpha j is 2i epsilon i j k sigma k. Eventually, not now, because we are not yet ready yet for that, we'll identify this capital sigma as the generator of rotations in the spinor space. Generation, generator of rotations in the spinor space, obviously, meaning it's a spin operator, capital sigma. Like the ordinary Pauli sigmas are the spin operators in the two-dimensional spin or space. It's very similar in nature, however, of course, it has different because we are in four dimensions now. So what does it mean? If the alpha i and alpha j are proportional to the velocity operator, if I convert this into an expression involving the velocities, so what do I get? Vi Vj, use that ugly notation of writing operator, obviously we'll have c times alpha, c times alpha, so I, I will have c squared 2i epsilon i j k c squared sigma k. Strange. It looks as if I cannot simultaneously measure two different components of the velocity. A, pr a feature which is so different than the Schrodinger theory, right? In the, well, remember, this is the free particle. When there's electromagnetism, obviously we know that the kinetic momentum and canonical momentum are different. It is not that. In the Schrodinger version, we know that when you get the two different components of the velocity operator, which is m times, 1 over m times the canonical momentum, canonical momentum pi pj commute, so vi bj commute. So you can measure two different components of the Schrodinger velocity simultaneously, but here obviously you cannot. Work out the uncertainty relation for this private note. And see what is the delta vi delta vj is. And that is related to the expectation value of the spin. Spin comes in in a very beautifully strange manner. Isn't that interesting? Very profound. Spin plays a role in the non-measurability of the two different components of the velocity operator. I don't know. I always like this argument very much. I hope you share the same feeling. It is, it is beautifully interesting, isn't it? So eventually, once that continuity business let me list. Consistency with the energy momentum dispersion relation was built in and that it, that it produces a consistent continuity equation followed. What is left over? The covariance. That is, this equation represents the same physics in all inertial frames. Inertial frames are defined to be those which move with constant velocity with respect to each other. Einstein's theory of special relativity is telling us that laws of physics are the same in all inertial frames. In order this to be represent, to describe the same physics, we should prove that it has shape invariance, form invariance, the same form in all inertial frames. If I start from one frame and transform to another frame, which moves with constant velocity with respect to the original one, 
So I get the same equation and same form, so it describes the same physics. I will postpone that to a later st stage, because for that we have to work out a little bit the representations of the Lorentz groups. That is the, the relationship between four dimensional space times among each other, how those coordinates, space coordinates and time are related to each other when you go from one frame to the other inertial frame. We'll work it out. It's a beautiful game. It's, it's not going to cost us too much in time, of course, we have to do it. it uh, I'll, I'll try to finish it in about one hour or so. Some of you know this quite well. So uh, let me now... I, I'm finished essentially with the basic construction of the uh, Dirac equation. Now we can try to establish contact with some known cases. Okay, let me clean up the board so that we can indeed establish contact with the known cases. What are the known cases? The particle at rest is the most well-known case of all, right? If a particle is at rest, it is the extreme limit of non-relativistic regime. It's not even moving, it's sitting at rest. So what I'm going to do now is the first is non-relativistic connection. I use spy connection. Connection. How do we connect with the non-relativistic regime? Non-relativistic connection. The second is classical connection. Obviously, we have two different regimes that we have to establish contact. If what we have is the correct equation, which is an extension of the known cases from atomic distances and low speeds, or large distances and high speeds, there are different regimes obviously, that this is sort of a combination of those short distances and high speeds and it explains both regimes in a single shot, then we have to be able to go to those limits and verify that it reproduces the known facts in these two different regimes. Non-relativistic connection is taking the limit 1 over c going to 0. I write this in this funny fashion, c goes to infinity, right? We said that Relativity principles of Einstein and Galileo are the same. The only difference was, at the time of Galileo, they thought that light propagates instantaneously. It's only natural. They're used to the sh speeds of the ships or the horses at the order of 20 to 30 miles at the most. So they couldn't imagine that there could exist a speed of 300,000 kilometers per second. 300 million meters per second. And if you multiply it with 3,600, 1 billion meters per second. So it is huge. So we have to, if we would like to go to non-relativistic connection, ordinary life, your cars. 1 over c could take in to be zero approximately. I will check that. And if you, if I plot a funny the, a primary school diagram, here is the velocity axis and here is the upper limit of all the signals. That's c, that's zero. This is the extreme non-relativistic limit which is particle at rest. No motion. This is the Newtonian Galilean regime, and that's the extreme regime of relativity at the upper end. That's where the light is. That's the physics of light, right? It moves at the speed of light, 300,000 kilometers per second all the time. And anything goes in between, depends on your ability. Atomic physics have velocities at the order of C alpha or alpha c much better, right? right? Alpha is the 1 over 137, right? 
1% of the speed of light is the atomic physics. If you go deep inside the nuclear physics, squeeze them to five orders of magnitude, of course, uncertainty is telling you that when you squeeze in the space, the energy goes up five orders of magnitude, so relative the, the quantum chromodynamics, the strong interaction physics, involves speeds in, in that region, obviously. So what we have to do and in that diagram is check whether the, what is the form of that Dirac equation corresponding to this regime. And then eventually I'll find the intermediate regime, the correction, so that you know I will get extreme limit and the non-relativistic limit. I will reproduce. Okay, forget now. Newton's equation, for instance. or Schrodinger equation, sorry, for the quantum case. Now, classical connection is obtained by taking this limit. This was 1 over c goes to 0 limit. It is h bar goes to 0 limit. Indeed, this is the Newtonian physics. That is, we are at non-relativistic connection, so that's quantum but non-relativistic, B says Schrodinger. This is the classical connection, so it must be C, obviously C could be anything. C is not touched. So we can still have very high speeds in this region, but it's not quantum but classical physics that we are describing. When it's classical, obviously, we are at large distances, not the atomic scale. So daily distances, our scale of the mankind, scale of the mankind. So we'll check that limit as well. So let's go one by one after the break.